This is the Dave and Creech Show, the only podcast where podcaster C.J. Creech and actor Dave Sheridan come together to talk all things entertainment with your favorite entertainers. Want to ask our guests a question? Tweet them to at Dave Sheridan or at CJCNOV88, and they may be asked to our guests live on the show. We do have to ask you stay seated during the podcast because this ride may get a little bit hilarious. Now here's your hosts, Dave and Creech. Hey everybody and welcome to the Dave and Creech Show, episode 20. We've got a great show for you this week. First of all, I'd like to say that I'm Dave Sheridan and I'm here with my co-host Creech. Say hi, Creech. Yes, I'm, I'm here. There you go. <laughs> Okay, well, this week, the majority of our show is going to be talking to one of my friends and fellow filmmakers, writer, producer, director, Ryan Colucci. He's going to be talking to us about several of his projects. One of the projects, which I star in, called White Space, which has been in post-production for quite some time. It's actually a CG-driven space epic adventure movie, and hopefully we will see it out in the movie theater someday. Another movie he has, which is currently at the Cannes Film Market, not at the film festival. It's not actually screening, but it's called Suburban Cowboy. We're going to talk to him about that, and we're also going to talk to him about his newest and bluest and truest. He's got a hand-drawn animation feature film, which he's trying to get the funding for, and he's started a Kickstarter campaign, and the name of that film is called – what is it called, Creech? I forget. It is called Orient City. What else is on tap? Did you – have you caught up on your Fear of the Walking Dead, Creech? Uh, no, I'm actually a couple episodes behind on Fear of the Walking Dead. Uh, I just haven't had the drive to watch it. Not that it's, it's been bad or anything like that. I just, it's been low on my totem pole of, of shows to watch. It doesn't help that I got, I kind of got addicted to a new show that uh, I find is, is still way more entertaining than, uh, Fear. So I've been watching that instead, but. Don't tell me. It's not Sesame Street, is it? What is it? No, no, I've I've been addicted to Sesame Street for a while. This is actually called Silicon Valley, and uh, oh. I kept hearing a lot of good stuff about it, and I watched it, and binge watched the entire first two seasons, and everything up to last week, and it's good. Yeah, that's cool. Yes, I'd like so, to check so, that out someday. It's tough for me to check those things I out. I'm friends with my judge. Uh, it's tough. It's tough. I, I'm friends with him, friendly with him. I've pitched him multiple times. And uh, I had a show called um, Kings of Silicon Valley. And um, it was very similar, you know. And so it's hard to watch things when there's a version I had and then somebody makes it. Does that make sense? It's hard for me to watch that. Let's talk about news. What have we got in the news, buddy? First one is actually something we talked about uh, one of the first episodes of our podcast. We we talked back then about the casting announcements for the Rocky Horror Picture Show uh, reboot, and now this week they released the trailer. And boy, okay, is it is it bad? In my opinion, it, it seems so far that. Uh, it hasn't been getting many positive responses off, off the channels that I've looked at reviews and feedback from. But in the end, it still at this point is no Ghostbusters, which uh, has the dubious distinction of being the most disliked video on in YouTube history. Um, what do you, whoa, so, wait a second. Wait a second. Back it up. You're talking about the new Ghostbusters? Yes. The trailer? I thought the trailer looked hilarious. I, th- I thought it was great. Well, the rest of the world does not um, hold your sentiments. Do you feel like it's not going to do well in the box office then? Uh, I don't think it is. I have to say I don't like the look of the new uh, the new vehicle though. <laughs> it's a hearse, right? I get – yeah. It's a, it has like a pink top in the back. I don't know. I just I, – I don't know. I'm really attached well, to the old one, I question. guess. Did the old one get blown up or something? Why couldn't they just keep the old one? I felt like that should have been one callback. That and Slimer. I hope Slimer's in it. 
Is I, I would is I think that was the guy's. Name. Yeah, yeah. Slimer's Slimer's in the trailer, and they just released a new trailer today that has the uh, the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. Right. And it so it looks like the monsters from the old series are coming they back. Have, I mean, I never saw Ghostbusters three or four or five, or whatever number they were up to. Did they blow up the ambulance at some point and they all got killed? I don't know, but no. Or do you think they're saving? No, them? they. they think there's a special little cameo for for Bill Murray and and Dan Aykroyd, and they're like pulling up in the the. Um, it would be funny if they pull up in the Blues Brothers car instead. That would be hilarious, right? Well, well. Here's the thing: they they made two Ghostbusters movies, and then it had taken so long they they wound up making a video game like mid two thousands that basically served as Ghostbusters three. Uh, and now with Harold Ramis dying, uh, the surviving members from the original Ghostbusters all have some sort of cameo in the new Ghostbusters. Wow. But they haven't revealed what it was, and apparently Bill Murray was quoted as saying that it's a new character he's playing. He's, he's not playing Vinkman be from think, Ghostbuster. Think Harold Ramis is probably a ghost in the movie, don't you think? I don't know. He might. I mean, he he died before they started shooting, but they could always do like a CG ghost or just reuse some footage of him from the past no, and they, he's a real use ghost, it to make a ghost. Dude, it's real ghosts in that movie. He's a real ghost. Oh, what do you think? They you don't think okay. the movie's real? <laughs> it's a doc. No, no, I, it's a documentary. I thought, I, I thought, I thought Paranormal Activity They're was real. They're real. They're real, man. They're watching us. I see dead people. Come on, man. Okay, so these are the numbers. Uh, the, and as of right now, of me viewing it, it has thirty-two million seventy-one thousand. 877 views, 238,000 thumbs up, and 806,000 thumbs down. Wow. That's not good news. That is not good news. Now, if that's any barometer or barometer for the public perception and the public sort of acceptance of how what kind of uh, box office numbers that will convey to, I don't know, man. You know what? Here's the thing. It's... These are the people putting the thumbs down are probably people that are tied to the original Ghostbusters. Take it for what it's worth. What if there was no all male Ghostbusters? What if there wasn't the Bill Murray one? And just on its own, if that movie was, you never heard of Ghostbusters and this thing came out and it looked like this and it had this, you, there would be some intrigue and people would be interested. But I would think my daughter and my son might actually like this movie. You know what I mean? And they're not going to know anything about the original Ghostbusters, so. Oh, yeah, I think kids will love it anyway because, you know, they're, like you said, most of them aren't going to know about it. But but for all of us who lived through the Ghostbusters, like if, second, like it actually happened, but th- those films, you know, I think, I don't know. I you said lived, I think like it, lived uh, through the Ghostbusters. Yeah, yeah, that's just that's what I was just saying. Like we like they were actual events that like, happened. Similar to the Holocaust or the nine eleven. But man, if you were there, if you lived through the Ghostbusters, you wouldn't think it was good at all, man. Okay. So you sent me a couple news clips. Right? Yeah. This one was that the man pulls two bags of pot from his underwear in front of the courtroom. What was this about? Well, um, we we could read it, and uh, I mean we'll we'll talk about it for sure. But they actually have the conversation in here, and I feel like it would actually be kind of funny to uh, to quote unquote act through it. You want to be the court, and I'll be Mr. Dabney. Is that what you're saying? Play along on this because they actually wrote this thing out in the article, huh? So what are you what are you trying to say? Uh, a man in Hamilton Court courtroom finally gave in and pulled out two bags of pot from his underwear a move that landed him an extra day in jail just an extra day but i guess he also had to turn in his marijuana um the hamilton county municipal court judge bernie bichard um stopped court on wednesday after an overwhelming smell of marijuana allegedly took over the courtroom bouchard gave everyone a chance to claim responsibility for the marijuana before he ordered deputies to bring drug dogs into the courtroom. The defendant, Darius Dabney, raised his hand and admitted to smoking marijuana before entering the courthouse. The conversation that ensued took turn. Here's the full transcript. (laughs) 
This courtroom has an overwhelming smell of marijuana. So whoever has it, if you want to give it up right now, it's going to be destroyed. If you don't, we're bringing the drug dog over, and you're going to be doing a lot of time in jail when we find it. So, who has the marijuana? Mr. Dabney raises his hand. Yo, I I smoked marijuana before I got here. Okay, well, do you have it on you? Um, No, sir. Well, it doesn't smell to me like burnt. I'm cool, then. You're safe, you think? I know I am. What time did you smoke it? Shit, like 9, 9.15. I'll be honest about that. I mean, I ain't gonna hold up on you, Mr. Bernie. You know, I just got out of probation, violation for dirty piss, so I smoked this morning. I ain't gonna hold up on you, nope, nope, I ain't gonna hold up on you, nope, nope, it's me, I got... What's your name? Do you remember that? I don't know that now. Okay. Why don't you come up here and have a seat so we can maybe, maybe we can take it out in the hall. I don't care what your name is. Come on up. Maybe you can remember your name by the time you sit up here. Have a seat right over here. Well, we have his attorney here. Mr. Rendering, his attorney. No, this is a court a court guy. He, go ahead, step up. Let yes. He steps up. You have Mr. Moore? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. No, no, no. Right here. What's his name? Mr. Moore? This is Mr. Moore, his attorney. Dabney. Darius Dabney, Your Honor. He did answer his name earlier, though, Judge. What happened on Mr. Dabney here is for probation violation. What happened was he was locked up, didn't report to probation, and just recently got out of a felony PV. And celebrated. Evidently so, sir. Yeah, well, I don't think I can take a plea from him today because he's not of sound mind. Can I come back? Yeah, you're going to come back. But here's the problem. You're going to stay with us for a couple days. Say what? Yeah. So I got my son outside. Like, I really have my son. Like, I got to pick up my son at, like, 10, 11. Your Honor, I did speak to him earlier, and he knew his name, and he knew essentially why he was here and that sort of thing. I didn't strike me as someone who was intoxicated, Judge. I know that he was kind of carrying on a little bit back there, but I think he was just having fun, essentially is what it comes down to, Judge. I am satisfied that he's ready to proceed. Well, thank you for that, but I mean, he just admitted that he smoked marijuana right before he came to court. Oh my gosh. Right, Mr. Bernie? It's Judge Bouchard, but that's okay, Mr. Dabney. You want to step on up here, Mr. Dabney? I'm finding you in contempt, sir, for coming to court high, wasting the court's time, public defender's time, Everybody's time that's getting paid here. You can't enter a plea because you're not of sound mind, so you're going to do a day in jail for that on contempt. I'm going to continue your case until tomorrow morning. Your bond is $1,000 anyway. At 10%? You're going to be doing a day anyway, so tomorrow we can take care of it. Now listen to me, Mr. Dabney. If you got it on you, it's going to be a felony when they strip you over there, so I'll give you one last time to tell me if you have any unburnt marijuana on you. I'm giving you, oh, defendant defendant. pulled out a bag of marijuana from his compartment. The court. Okay, so finally you came clean. Now, if there's anything else, this is your opportunity. We're going to destroy it. Are you sure? The defendant pulls out another bag of marijuana out of his pants. Uh, uh, oh my lord. Uh, anything else? I mean, because... No, that's it. Mr. Dabney, I'm telling you. Now, why would you do that? Why would you bring that much pot to court? I forgot it was in my car, sir. You forgot it in your underwear? He said car, sir. Say what? I don't know, sir. You don't know. Well, I don't know why you would do that either. Well, Judge, I mean, it's... If he implied impaired to the point that he can't take a plea, he probably is not thinking clearly. Good point. Mr. Dabney, well, you know. Yes, sir. You know what? I just want to tell you one thing. You know, at some point in your life, all you have left is your word, okay? You know, and to be honest, you hear what I'm saying? You know, it's just so disappointing Mm -hmm. that, you know, you try to lie. Mm -hmm. I've been in court every day for 20 years as an Mm -hmm. assistant prosecutor, a magistrate, and a judge. And for you to think... Yeah, for you to think that I'm stupid Mm -hmm. and you're going to pull one over on me, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just illogical. Mm -hmm. But you know what? 
I appreciate in this courtroom is honesty. You know, mm-hmm. if you can say I did something, exactly. I'm sorry. I learned from it. That goes a long exactly. way than no, I didn't and lying, mm-hmm. you know? Exactly. So, I mean, you did come clean, but mm-hmm. it took a little coaxing. But that's better than you getting charged with a felony for bringing drugs into the jail. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I hope that you at least learn from this and can be honest in the future. Judge, he might not realize it, but he appreciates you giving him the opportunity to get rid of it. Okay. Well, we'll see you tomorrow morning. You're in contempt doing a day, and then your bond is $1,000. That's like 10%. Later on, the two bags of marijuana weighed 1.5 ounce. According to officials, Dabney is scheduled to appear in court again Friday morning to face his probation violation. Let's hope he doesn't come with any cocaine shoved in his ass. Stay tuned. And let's hope let's hope his kid actually got picked up. I got picked up my kid like 10 or 11, I don't know, somewhere in there. He could wait an hour. You know, like my kid, like my kid. See you, y'all. Yes, his kid's like, my dad's coming. I know he is. He's coming. That, and he's still waiting Your there. dad's probably in jail for having marijuana in his pants. That's not funny. Take that back. No way they call them marijuana pants. You know it. That only happened once. Meanwhile, it happened again. All right, what else is going on in the news? There is a video that's <laughs> gone viral. Of a little, of a you know, a teenage boy who apparently has found his inner gangster on his, uh, with um, the help of a little bit of pharmaceuticals on, uh, following a surgery. Dubai was lit. Yeah, bro, Dubai was lit. I was did you like, buy, did, you buy, I was, did you buy anything else in Dubai? Did I buy anything else? I- did they ask if he bought anything in Dubai? Dubai was like, me. And he's like over in England, like right? Aliens, strippers, man. Oh. strippers. What? No strippers. No many strippers, bro. No strippers. What are you talking about, freaky get, woman? How did you? <laughs> what are you laughing at me? <laughs> what are you talking about, freaky woman? And he's the whitest thirteen-year-old kid, and he's channeling this like <laughs> gangster guy. It's hilarious. All right, honey. Let's get this weird accent. Did you? Pick Cause it? you buy people with all up in my grill and my boy Rocco Carlo and knock them out cold, man. Who's Rocco? Rocco, my boy. You know, <laughs> you know Rocco. Rocco was like, "Yo, bro," and I was like, "Yo, Rocco, go we'll sock him." And Rocco was like, and I was like, "Yo, Rocco, you get that ass, man." Don't tell my lawyer we kill people, man. <laughs> What you laughing at? It's not joking, man. And then it ends. What you, la- what you laughing at? I'm not fucking joking, man. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty funny stuff. There's not much to say, except that's funny. If you see the video, go watch it, because it's funny. Yeah, and that is going to wrap it up for weird and entertainment news this week. Up next is our interview with Ryan Colucci. <laughs> We're on the phone with Ryan Colucci. I met you, Ryan, um, on the film White Space, right? Yes, the epic space odyssey. We, it'll be done January of uh, this coming year. Like the, It'll be done by the holidays. It will be done by the holidays. We shot what? it sometime shot like before yesterday. Ago. Yeah, we, we shot, shot it like before yesterday, ago. right? Uh, yes. And that's when I met you, and what, what was your involvement on White Space? Uh, well, I was the lead producer, and I also wrote it. Uh, and came up with the idea with Kenny, the director, who you had a personal relationship with before the film, right? The, oh, that's right. That's how I got involved with the film, that I shot another movie, which he was a visual effects supervisor on or something like that, right? Yeah, he does um, a lot of the bar- director. Yeah. Or you used to do a lot of barter work where it'd be like, I'll come on as a producer and do your 50 visual effect shots. Right. 
Um, now, um, and so you co-wrote that one, White Space, right? Yeah, the, with uh, I came up with the idea with Kenny, and then I went off and I wrote like a 40-page outline, and I was busy at the time. I forget what I was working on, but I was like, I don't, I'm not going to write this script. It's not in me. You know, I just, I, I wasn't feeling it after I'd written like this 40-page outline, and the outlining process for me is much longer, harder part. Uh, and then I had somebody that actually reviewed a graphic novel of mine that was like, hey, can I send you a script? The script was awesome. And there's a guy named Clay, uh, Clay McLeod. And I was like, I got this outline. Do you want to take a read? And he's like, I'll, I'll do this for you. He wrote that script in like a month. I rewrote it. And within like two months, we were in pre-production. It was pretty insanely fast how it all came together once the script was finished. So he, who wrote the script? Clay McLeod. Got it, got it, got it. And uh, and then the the, your one, your feature before that was called Battle for Terra? Yes. And and what was, that's a cartoon, that's an animated cartoon? Yeah, it's a CG feature. Um, Yeah. I I was right at grad school. Uh, I went to USB for producing, and I came out and uh, was working with a partner out of there. And we were actually looking for a live-action film. And you'd be surprised. I was hitting every festival I could possibly hit. We had money. We were a finance company. And we were going to do like a $250,000, $300,000 feature. We could not find a feature to do. If we saw a short that we really loved, the director had – uh, no, no project lined up. It was crazy. Uh, if it, it, it was totally insane. And then we saw this short, this animated thing, and I'm like, oh, let's meet with these guys. Most of the time, when you see an animated short, it takes forever for them to do, and it's just not feasible as a feature. Uh, at least the pipeline that they come up with. And uh, this guy had done this through the Fox Search Labs, which don't exist anymore. And he's like, yeah, I did this in a month. And it was awesome. And we kind of put our heads together, and we just said, screw it, let's do it. So we took the money right. we were going to put into a live-action film and did, um, got a script written, did the uh, full animatics for the film, for the script, which took about a year, and did a scene, so like a four-minute scene in final quality. And that was like essentially... Uh, 250000 or so, um, give or take. And then once we had that finished, we were able to shop that scene to cast and talent, and also we were financed pretty rapidly uh, right after that. Um, because at the time, no one was doing an independent animation, and the budget that we had for it was so much lower than what everyone else could do. Um, but everyone else is telling us when we when we first started doing it, everyone's like, "You can't do independent animation," and then we're like, "Okay, well we're, we're going to build a studio in LA," and they're like, "You can't build your own studio," and then they're like, "Well, you can't get cast for it," and everyone wants to tell you no. Well, let me let me let me back that up then. Uh, so you had you saying you had two fifty. Where did you guys have the two fifty from to begin with? Uh, well, when we came out, it was. Uh, my, me, and, me and a partner from USC, and he had financing lined up. Got it. That I committed to put this money down on a film, whatever we decided to do. Got it. So it sounds like it was his mom and dad. Is that what you're trying to say? Uh, I don't want to con- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, essentially. Uh, let's say he had money. His, yeah, he's a billionaire. Oh, there you go. That always helps, right? That definitely yeah. helps. So then... You made this. You made the animated movie. Got a lot of good voices. So this this budget was this budget to this animated movie Battle for Terror was two hundred and fifty grand. No, that was just for the first year, uh, and we got the animatic script and scene done. Right. So at the time, it was like if you made an animated project, you were minting money. Um, and then we wound up riding the three D wave. We finished. We didn't shoot. We didn't actually produce it in 3D. It premiered at Toronto, and after Toronto, we went backwards. And because there was more, there was a marketplace for 3D at the time, 
and actually retrofitted it for in 3D. Hmm. And we were supposed to get a ton. Of, we were supposed to get like an obscene amount of 3D screens, but uh, I think it was Inside Out or uh, Mo- sorry, Monsters vs. Aliens came out right before us, and they just were selling out all the 3D screens. And at the time, Lionsgate was not Lionsgate it is now because it was before Hunger Games, before Twilight. And if you have a theater chain that's dealing with Disney or Lionsgate, they're going to stick with the line. Lionsgate didn't have the leverage to say, you need to book our movie. You know, are you committed to putting our movie in? You've got to take this DreamWorks movie out. Um, you know, Paramount had a lot more pull. So we, we got, like, almost no 3D screens that we were supposed to get, and it really wound up killing our box office. But in the long run, like, home video and internationally, it did really well. Got it. So the film itself, um, and we knew going in, I don't think I'm hurting anyone's feelings involved with the film, the amazing director, uh, the, the, the writer kind of phoned it in on us. Um, you know, we thought, we were, we were really young, we were really, I don't want to say naive, but uh, he came in, sold us a bill of goods, then, you know, was not getting like, was getting, a, I, I thought at the time, a lot of money. But uh, he just phoned it in, and we got the script, and we were kind of devastated. And we weren't in a position where we can go and spend a shit ton of money and keep getting it rewritten. Uh, And the problem with the script was that it was like this weird – it wasn't funny at all. And we have these creatures that are cute looking, but at the same time, there's this war at the end and this battle and – it, it always existed in this nether world of uh, like too young, too mature for kids and not mature enough for real sci-fi fans. Uh, and the script didn't help. So when it premiered at Toronto, that was actually the reaction was this is way too fucking dark. So we had to go back and cut. They went back and cut out all of not all of it, but like more of the darker stuff to kind of kid friendly it up. And but it's animated. It's not like you have this footage laying around on the floor that you cut out of the movie. If something right. has to be redone, you have to recreate it. So, you know, it, we, they did what they could to get that, to make it lighter. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, the whole third act is an entire battle scene. You know, there's people right. dying, there's aliens dying. Oh, it's, it's pretty morbid. Um, and then yeah. you have these cute little creatures. We actually had a deal with Burger King, or Lionsgate took a deal with Burger King, in their Happy Meals to have the creatures, and that lasted all about two weeks. It was pretty they, cool. uh, they did come out? They did come out in the, in, the, in the Burger King Happy Meals? Yeah. But it's just because it wasn't out in the theater, it wasn't an exploding hit in the theater, that that, that promotion just didn't last that long, you're saying? Yeah, it, it did not last. I don't know, <laughs> maybe a week or two. And they were like, wait a second, no one knows right. what these things are. Twenty kids ate them and choked on them. They thought they were like, you know, <laughs> tangled like uh, apple chunks or something like that. Well, like you know, but first of all, I mean, that's a major. I mean, especially coming out of your first, you're coming out of grad school, and you make an animated movie that plays at Toronto, and you sell it to Lionsgate, and it gets on how many screens? We were on. We're supposed to be on 2,500. We wound up on about 1,500 or so. That's We're off still about a thousand 3D screens. Yeah. That's a pretty good release, especially when, like, your, you know, your figures end up, like, in some sort of Burger King Happy Meal thing. You must have been feeling fairly well about, like, whoa, this is, holy crap. Like, I, I'm a producer, and I made an animated major motion picture, you know, that I started yeah. my own... Like you know what's crazy? Studio. Yeah. You, you would think that, right? And I thought that. And I got no love. I, none. Um, you know, at the time, I had obviously contemporaries, kids that had graduated with me and stuff that had done live action, like this crappy horror movie. And, like, no offense to – this was a bad horror movie. I love the horror genre this was a bad horror movie and they were getting more love because they had done a live action movie. I mean, this is a movie that no one saw, no one picked up and they were just getting 
it was almost like I was a second class citizen because I did an animated film, and I'm like, my budget is ten, like ten times theirs. I have a much better cast that I was. We were able to pull together. I literally built an animation studio from scratch, you know, um, and <laughs> it was pretty humbling because I thought I was get. I thought I was going to take that next step, um, right. which is how White Space came around. Dave, the project that we did is yeah. But before you did White Space. Before you jump to White Space, you have this movie, it's on Lionsgate, came out, and you have this animation studio that you put together, which is, what is that, really, just a room full of computers, you're saying, or what? I mean, what's some Yeah, actually. So, actually. why, what made you shift, where was the next cartoon? Because we're getting to a cartoon that you're now on Kickstarter, you're, you're, you're on Kickstarter, you're raising money for a hand-drawn cartoon called Orient City, um, but now we're in the year 2016, going into 2017, and I know you've been working on this hand-drawn cartoon for quite a while, quite a amount of years, but in between that, was there, when you had Battle for Terror out and you sold it to Lionsgate, there must have been some sort of idea of what's next on the slate with animation and this animation studio. Where were, where did you see that going? Before we finished Battle for Terra, I had mm-hmm. set a project up at Warner Brothers. While I was yep. at USC, I got, I got the rights to a big fantasy series, and I set that up, and then right after I set it up, I left this, the animation studio. I'm still a producer on the movie. I was still there. Um, but I wasn't there day to day anymore, which right. be, like once the studio is up and running and the animatics are done and everything, you're talking about 30 seconds a week. If that is getting done. Um, and my partner at the time wanted to micromanage that. And I wanted to like, but there was no need to micromanage it. In fact, it was making it worse, micromanaging it. Um, and I was like, we need to worry about what's next. We need to, you know, I'm pretty ambitious. And, I want to be active, and I was not active there, and I set up this project, and it gave me the sort of impetus to, to leave, and um, I actually had another animated thing lined up that I was working on, uh, and the creator of it just kept flaking out, mm. and that was like a two-year ordeal. Um, and you'd be surprised, like, these things snowball. I was like, this is going to be my next thing. And this was for straight-up kids, because at the time, I learned my lesson. I was like, it needs to be either for kids or it needs to be for adults. Right, um, can't be a feathered fish. Yeah, and uh, this was straight-up for kids, and it's, like, the idea behind it's a gold mine. and I helped them put together a children's board book, and we were developing the script. He was dead set on writing the script himself, even though he couldn't write. And, you know, time, time, and Dave, you know this, uh, seems to snowball in development sometimes where you have something you start on and all of a sudden two years go by and you're like, what the hell happened here? Like, how, is, how do we not have a finished script by now? Um, but it's not always in your hands. If somebody else isn't delivering their end of the bargain or they are and it's bad, what do you do? So a few years went by on that and... Uh, we kind of cut bait, like I, I did at least, um, as White Space came to fruition. And when White Space came to fruition, um, I, I, had, like, I had always known that I wanted to be doing hand-drawn animation because those are my favorite, uh, whereas CG I really like, and obviously I have experience in it now. Um, and there are certain stories that make sense in CG, but I think adult animation for me makes sense hand-drawn because I don't think uh, human characters look, they're either, they're too real looking in CG and they feel creepy and soulless. Um, so it just makes sense as hand-drawn. And also there's like a artistry to it. Whereas I don't think there was an artistry to Battle for Terra at all. You know, for us that was a, a piece of commerce. Um, especially when we got script and it wasn't any good. And it was like, if we stop to go get a script written, we're going to add six months to a schedule. Six months on an animation schedule is is the death now, like in terms of finances, um, because you have to keep the studio up and running. Um, 
So it, it, it was like I, I had my next film. I thought I had my next film, and then the development just didn't happen as as I'd planned. You know, Dave, I'm sure you know, like you have scripts that, that start off sounding great, and then at the end of the day you look at the script and you're just like, this isn't, this isn't ready. This isn't something I'm going to spend a year or two of my life on. Or 10 years, yeah. Ten, 10 years, yeah. I mean, and this kid was so dead set on writing the script himself. And I had a you know, great got... title for a script. It was called Star Wars versus Harry Potter. Spent a lot of time <laughs> on it. And it just never came in the way, you know, I really envisioned it. And uh, it might have been the title. Anyway, <laughs> never worked out. Never worked out. Anyway, but that's Feather Fish. Another feathered fish. Was it kids or for adults? I don't know. But anyway, yeah. so then you got your, your – you, where did white space come into play in terms of the, the origins of white space? Well, so right when I kind of left there, I would set up this pro- – well, it was a real wake-up call because I set up this project at Warner Brothers, and I thought I was hot shit, and it was another major thing on my resume – and then it was like reality dawned, and Warner Brothers was kind of like, "Hey, thanks, kid. We'll call you uh, at the, you know after the premiere. We'll send you a DVD, essentially." Uh, and I'm like, "I just spent like five years hounding this author to give me the rights to this thing. Um, they don't give a shit." So at that point, I thought it's crazy to play this studio development game. I had friends that were in it. Uh, you know, I started in development. Uh, USC producing school is kind of like a feeder for the studio systems, which is great. But for me, I wanted to be active. I didn't get into this to take lunches and dinners and um, get laid. You know, I want to make movies. Hold so on. Like, Hold on. Because this podcast is for young, aspiring filmmakers. I, well, here. And there I, may be I, many I, of you out there get laid, that are in it I, to, take, to go get drinks, get free lunches, and get laid. And there's nothing wrong with that. My point is that I was getting laid. There are there are valuable reasons to get into this film business, and that is three valuable reasons. Okay, but those aren't reasons why Ryan Flucci got into it. Go ahead, Ryan. Well, there are awesome reasons, but I was getting laid with with no money in my bank account, and (laughs) like I didn't need to be a development exec or an agent to get laid, which I think a lot of people get into it to do because they can't get laid on their own. There you go. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> that's Carter just me sound Swan. like a asshole. But, Carter uh, Swan. <laughs> I just dropped the name. So hold on, picking him up. Carter Swan. <laughs> Not sure if he could get laid without being vice president of Trigger Street. We don't know. We don't know. But let me pick those up. Okay, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> so, I wanted to make movies. And I thought, I'm going to go make a bunch of movies. Uh, You know, if I have to go do smaller movies and make small movies that are really good, that are for, uh, you know, if I spend a little bit of money on them, I'm going to make them look like they cost ten times that. Uh, I was pretty confident in my ability to do that. Um, uh, You know, it just so happens that when I did start to do that, it was the writer's strike. So the entire industry shut down. Um, And at the time... I said, uh, fuck it, Um, and I made my graphic novel, which uh, is called Harbor Moon, and that was actually supposed to be the feature, and the company that was supposed to finance it was like, oh, it's a writer's strike, fuck it, we're not dealing with that, so we made the graphic novel, and as I was coming out of the graphic novel and doing press on that, um, the press, I was fucking emailing blog sites (laughs) to interview me, but... uh, as I was coming out of that is when I first met Kenny, the director of White Space, and hatched this whole idea. So how did you meet Kenny? And, and, and tell me a little bit about Harbor Moon, the, the, the graphic novel. Well, Harbor Moon was written with somebody uh, from USC. Uh, it's, we, we actually wrote it to be like a spaghetti western, to be honest with you, which is kind of like what Orient City is. Orient City is mm-hmm. a samurai spaghetti western. But, uh, you know, Spaghetti Westerns are my favorite genre. So, right. And so my partner on Harbor Moon, Decron Arnickian, who is a, just a straight-up screenwriter now, even though we went to producing school, um, 
we both love that genre. I brought the idea to him. He was like, oh, this sounds cool. Let's do it. It just so happens that it has werewolves in it. Uh-huh. So it's a spaghetti western with werewolves. And when we made the book, I didn't necessarily set out to make a horror book. I set out to make a mystery because it has all these kind of layers, or we think they're layers, uh, and a, more of a western vibe to it. And everyone's like, oh, cool horror book. And I'm Eventually, you just have to embrace it. I mean, at the end of the day, it is a horror book. It has blood and gore and everything. Um, but to me, it's more of a mystery and a spaghetti western than anything. Uh, it would be awesome to see that come to life one day on screen. Uh, there were, you know, Part of it was that this company had taken a press release out. It was on the cover of Variety. They are going to do a trilogy. And then the writer strike happened, and they, the company actually imploded, and they ran out of money during the strike. Uh, then it was like anytime anybody looked this project up or was, it was like, oh, this company didn't do it uh, or it's sitting at this company still, which is not the case at all. They never closed the deal for us even. You know, these companies take out these releases and they don't even close the deal for the rights first because the company that was going to do it was Stone Village and they're really shady. You know, and I was coming, I was young. I still am young, but... You know, I don't know these things. And me and my – the first time we were in there, he liter- they literally were like, hey, we want to make this. And we were like, awesome, let's do it. They handed us a contract in the room. It was one page long. And, and at I looked the bottom it, of it, it was signed by the Jackson 5, and it was scratched out. Being like, go ahead, sign this contract. It was insane. Uh, I can't <laughs> believe – I was like, you guys know that I'm not from she- – like, no offense to anyone from Sheboygan, but, like, I'm not uh, straight off a bus from Sheboygan, like, Oh, we know a lot of people from Sheboygan. I wish I just had a whole bunch of them. Yeah. So, so they wanted you to sign a contract right there in the room? Wasn't that enough just to get the hell out of there? <laughs> yeah, so I was like, well, are you guys kidding? Do you guys were actually – you know, and we were, all, we were so swayed by the fact they said they were going to make this movie. And they had – at the time, they had just made Teristas and some other stuff, and they had the money to go make stuff, or they were saying they did. And then the more we kept on covering, like, uh, layers of the onion, the more it was like agents won't take their calls because they're shysters and everyone, no one takes them seriously because they're shady. And you should have seen this contract. It was hilarious. Uh, it was like, essentially, you pay us 5000 and we'll make your movie. Um, and I was like, no, I'm going to, I'll send you a contract. And then we were going back and forth on the option. They didn't want to pay any money for it. And it was like, you know, I'm spending my own money to do this graphic novel. I need to get that back at least. Like, you're taking this off the table before the graphic novel comes out. Like, what happens if the graphic novel does well, like 30 days a night, and someone snatches it up? Um, and then these assholes took a press release out, cover a variety type shit, and I see message boards now that's like, oh, Stone Village is going to make this, but they didn't. It must suck. And I'm like, fuck that. That's bullshit. Now, now, is that Suburban Cowboy? I know that's at Cannes right now, right? Yeah, yeah, it opened, right? I think we're. Uh, I think I might be in the running for the Palme d'Or. Are you joking? Yes. Okay, um, no, I thought you were. You mean in the Cannes Market or the festival? Yeah, the Cannes Market. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, it's being represented by Paradigm uh, mm-hmm. domestically. We're not going out internationally yet. We're going to try to the plan is to make a domestic deal first. Got so it. it's not technically at Cannes because that's more of an international marketplace, right, but right, right. Paradigm is there. Uh, this talk, all the domestic distributors are there, so they're having face-to-faces about it. We're hoping to have, uh, you know, it's a very specific film, so you don't, it's not a type of film that you sell to Paramount. So the distrib- distributor list that we're, going to is very specific, so they were having face-to-faces with all those people. Some of them had seen it before, Can The response we're getting is awesome. It's like, you know, there's maybe been two or three passes so far, and it's, hey, we're making theatrical films. We need a star in it, and this movie doesn't have, a, you know, quote, you know, a name. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, our title design, actually, which is hand-drawn animation, was at South by Southwest for excellence in title design, which is like this weird obscure category there. That I was like, everyone loves our, hand, our title design that we did. Let me just 
submit it to this thing for some uh, publicity because the film wasn't going to be ready by then. And right. it got in. And then I saw who it was up against. It's crazy. Spectre, Avengers, Age of Ultron, uh, the Daredevil titles, uh, you know, shit, stuff like that. It was crazy. Just so people understand, you're not making the entire feature film for 30 grand. You're trying to make the short, which will be the jumping off point and, and really being the big selling tool that will get get you to about, you know, what you're looking for is maybe like two, two and a half million, right, to make a feature film. Yeah. So this exists essentially as, like, it's like a short film prequel to the to the movie. So it's not like, hey, give us money so that we can go make a, another movie. We're going to kill ourselves to make a fucking awesome movie here. Um, and it's going to exist as its own thing. Um, so, but yeah, it's, it's like we, we created this whole world and this is the first kind of start of the world. Um, you know, like the opening intro into Orient City and this character, uh, two, two lead characters, which is uh, this guy Boshi and who's a fallen samurai and then this young girl, Nessa, who he's sworn to protect, uh, and her family gets assassinated, and they wound up heading to Orient City to get revenge. Um, and that's kind of the the genesis of the short. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a samurai spaghetti western, and it is all, it's ultra-violent. It's violent in the way that Kill Bill is violent, and, you know, some Robert Rodriguez movies are violent. I also just kind of get hungry when you're talking about it. Samurai Spaghetti Western. I almost want to go to Nothing But Noodles and just get, like, the fettuccine with, like, shrimp in it. You know what I mean? I don't know why, but I'm just – maybe just because I'm hungry right now. <laughs> but, um, and, and, you know, I, I'm not joking, dude. I kind of get hungry, which could be a good thing. You know, hey, you've got your – got the Burger King character before. Maybe you can get a Nothing But Noodles or some sort of – Panda uh, Express. Hana. <laughs> exactly, Panda Express – to put the uh, put to put out the uh, the special Orient City, uh, you know, mesquite, uh, you know, uh, uh, chi- Chinese noodles. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's like the Western Chinese noodle thing. Um, no, but yeah, obviously, you know, food is a big part of you, you, when you watch your short, and people will understand why I'm kind of getting hungry when I watch it. You paint a very visual world and it does even get the aromas of that world out in my mind. So go back. Let's jump back to white space. We were shooting in Los Angeles. Uh, Dave, you can comment on this because you were there. Uh, SAG doesn't have anywhere to go, right, uh, because most things weren't shooting in Los Angeles at the time. That's right. Everyone goes somewhere right. else. So yep. SAG used to send a rep to all these sets all the time to check on the welfare of their actors. Now they're, right. now they're so board we had our guy show up like five days in a row he was nice but i'm like what is this guy doing like i think he just wanted to hang out i've never had a sag rep show up as much as sag was there so i was under the idea that somebody had a red flag on them as a producer or Dave, dave you actually called me or so the next thing we did after that was with you which was a companion piece to an album it was a that's film. right or uh, Dirty South or Dragon Regantes. Yep. yep. Um, so, Dave, you got a call about that. Right. Because like, that was done under the new media agreement, right. which they always check up on. So you got a call, and then you call me. You're like, yo, is there something you want to tell me? Are you red flagged right. by SAG for some reason? And I'm like, no, I'm fine. Right. Because uh, I think you're. I think there's something shady going on with you. Uh, yeah, because I've never had SAG. The only two times SAG ever talked to me about a production was both of yours, and I was like, "What the heck is going on here?" Right? Well, but I, so but I also think that the, the story guy, of the one of the actors, really quick on White Space, one of the actors really friended up the SAG rep and was just like chatting him up, you know, at the craft service table, up like and was giving the SAG guy like a platform was giving him like, hey, you and I chatted. You're, you're a pretty big star. And you're well, tell him what happened. 
huh? you, you and me were the two people that were there when that – it was Holt, McCallany. Right, it was right? Holt, right. Yeah, I didn't but want do you remember when anyway. the sad guy never came back? Why that happened? Probably because cause the Holt just chatted his ear off or something. It was just no, like, what are we one day do in the, about this? There was a, a back, like, green room area, and there was, like, a little yeah. kitchen. Yeah. And Holt – I don't know what happened. I, I'd walked in from set because there, there was a stage door. You were in the room with them. Uh, right. I'm surprised you don't remember this. Holt, I guess they got into a an, uh, discussion about SAG and how in the last contract they had lost some right. things that Holt was right. fired up about. And he starts yelling at this guy. And Holt's a big dude. He's right. a really big guy. And this guy was like this older, kind of effeminate guy. Yeah, he and was small, I come kind of frail. Stage, and all I hear is yelling. And I think there's a fight. And then you come out and you're dying laughing. And <laughs> the guy yeah. comes scurrying, literally scurrying out, and he bolts through the state, like the uh, like sliding doors. Like, you know, you fit like a truck through. We always had him open. He runs right. out. This guy had been there like five days in a row, never came back. He was yelling about, like, because I guess you used to have to be flown first class and things like right. that. And Hope just, like, he was, like, he laid into him, like, taking right. his, like, frustration out on this guy. And uh, yeah. you were in the room, you were in the kitchen with him. I remember that. I think that, yeah, I think I was just egging Holt on, going, like, I agree. Oh, yeah, man. And he was like, we need to get our rights back. We need to get our flights back. I mean, I mean, you know what I mean? You, you got to get in there. You got to fight for us. Why did you let this boat happen? And the guy was like, I, I, I'm just here for the, the crap. You know what I mean? The guy was like, yeah. out. Was he was like, looking for free snacks. And Holt just yeah. Holt, Holt was trying to be like, uh, you know, like some sort of union worker, like, the, when Sally Field played in that one movie, I don't know what it was, you know what I'm talking about, where she was like the, the, the metal worker. and she like, that a one? So John Sure. Taylor. I forget what it was, but it was the one where she was just like, you know, the whistleblower on the union and made everybody walk out or whatever. It was just like as if Holt was going to make us all walk out or something and <laughs> we'd go on strike again, you know, some solidarity movement. I was like, okay, man, yeah, I'm just – let me squeeze by here and get some pretzels, you know? Every you know, day there was pretzels. something happened that I was like, is this really my fucking set? Is this my life? Like, I thought he was going to choke the sad guy out. One guy, this 90-year-old dude is sunbathing in his Speedos outside the set. It was yeah. mayhem. Well, either way, that, that movie's coming out soon. It'll be done in January of 2017. And now, you know, you're here, Orient City, Hand-drawn, cartoon, spaghetti western. It's a samurai story. Um, you created your this world. Going to have a lot of uh, people voice characters, and you're doing the the um, you know a Kickstarter. Best case scenario, you raise your thirty grand. How long will it take you then to make the short? How long will something like this take? It it will be done December first. Without a doubt, that includes. Um, I budgeted uh, a month for ske- sorry scheduled a month to do all the rewards because a lot of our rewards are personalized artwork. Mm-hmm. So obviously we can't be animating while we're doing personalized artwork um, because animation is drawn. So I scheduled a month to handle all that. You know, if it there's no way it's going to take longer um, than a month to do that stuff. So. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be done in a month. And we'll do that at the tail end. So we, if we finish, you know, the way you schedule animation is by the frame. So everything is down to the frame almost. There's a chance, chances we finish early. Uh, you know, every time I schedule something, I put a huge pad in. It's just smart that way. So there's a chance we finish much earlier. And then he starts, we start doing the art commissions even sooner and get everything out even earlier. But everything will be out right. before, so people have stuff for the holidays. Uh, John Bohr, my partner on it, is in Hungary. So any commission, anyone that's listening, <laughs> if you have an international audience, we're sending stuff directly from Europe, so it will get there for the holidays as well. It's going to be awesome. What are some of the rewards that you're offering on the uh, Kickstarter? We can get the movie. Uh, digitally, DVD, Blu-ray. We have T-shirts. Uh, 
you know, the mistake I made on the graphic novel Kickstarter was I had like five different T-shirts, mm-hmm. and it was like we we had sold so many, but it was like ten of this one, seventy of this one, ten of this, you know. I was like, oh shit, um, this one we have one T-shirt, but in black and white. Um, we have two versions of the uh, poster, two pretty different versions of the poster. We have art prints, which are the thing that uh, seems to get the most response, which we have about 18 of them. And they're all things like we have uh, a Batman samurai, uh, one of the a Ninja Turtle as like a outlaw bandit Western character, things like that. And then we have a bunch of like samurai. It's all kind of based on our world samurai western type world and since it's animation and hand drawn we thought it'd be cool to do animated cells you know like traditional Disney how they drew on cells so what we're going to do is we have uh, there's going to be eight frames which we don't know what they are yet because the film's not done but there'll be a selection of eight that we'll send to anyone that wants it or pledges for it and I'll choose one and then every layer of animation will get its own cell and will send those to be framed. Um, oh, that's very which pretty, cool. Which is pretty cool. It's going to be pretty badass. So, Dave and CG, you guys saw the opening shot of the film, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so just for anyone who hasn't seen it, it is. it starts at the bottom of the city at the water, and it's a boom up through a lot of the city, and you wind up stopping, and then there's this long push into a saloon, like an old west saloon. Uh, so you you actually transverse a lot of the city and you get the feel that it's vertical. Um, and what we did is we took, and I think this is one of our cooler rewards, we took that entire shot, which is like massively long, because it's all one piece of art, um, and we were making it uh, a scroll print, you know, like the old Chinese scrolls? Right. So it's 92 inches long and 16 inches wide will be the final dimensions, then it'll be on, like, a scroll. Got it. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, you got to be pretty cool. diehard to, to, to want that, but, like, it's going to be pretty badass. Uh, Speaking of goals, it's pretty here's, easy. Here's a, I do have to get off now because my Starbucks in my area closes early, and I have to grab at least a cup of coffee here because I've got a deadline on something else I have to do for building my house. So we're going to wrap it up. All right, thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. All right, guys. Well, that is going to be it for today. We hope you've had a great time listening. And make sure you definitely contribute to Ryan's Kickstarter for Orient City. It's great uh, goals. or uh, what are, they? are they considered goals? Or is that what his goals are? I'm, I'm, He's got a goal. They're considered um, you rewards. Could guess, I guess you can call them rewards. They call them rewards, and there's all sorts of stuff. I mean, you could donate as little as five dollars, ten dollars, fifteen dollars, twenty dollars, twenty five dollars. You know, uh, and there's all sorts of different uh, things for everything ranging from T-shirts to art prints <laughs> to Blu-rays. You know how like you know how it stacks up every time. So when you you know, when you toss in the $5, you get like an art lookbook or something like that. And then you toss in the $10 and you get a copy of the movie for $15. That bumps you up to Blu-ray for $20 or $25. You get the T-shirt and the Blu-ray, you know, and that kind of thing, you know. So it just keeps pushing up. You can, I, I believe, because I'm actually going to a site right now, you can go up as high as, um, let me scroll all the way down. Oh, my gosh, you can. You can pledge up to five thousand dollars, and there are zero backers. Five of five, and that will get you an executive producer, executive producer credit. Yeah, so get oh. your foot in the proverbial Hollywood door. All it costs you is was it five thousand? Yeah. So everybody out there just needs to make it rain on this Kickstarter, and we'll see everybody or talk to everybody. Next week. Shut up and sit down. Thank you for listening to the Dave and Creed Show. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of Dave and CJ. These views and opinions do not necessarily represent those of Creed Creative Productions or any of its affiliates.